Hello, hello, and welcome to Conserving Catholicism. My name is Nick, and we're back. It's been a little bit. Uh, last time we had the video on the paradox of the stone. I hope you guys enjoyed it. It was a fun video to make. I hadn't revisited uh, a few of those things in a while, a few of those uh, essays. So it was nice to to revisit them, relook at them, and share it with you all. I know that we haven't been so great on finishing our five way series. We'll get back to that. That will happen. Uh, we've just been been very busy. My semester is wrapping up here in Rome. Adam's very busy in, in Steubenville. But uh, pretty soon I'll be moving to DC and that's gonna be a lot of fun. I'm excited. I begin working as a fellow for the uh, Thomistic Institute uh, in mid June. So I'll be moving down there and uh, which is nice because it'll be my first time in a while that I'll be not a full-time student for like a full year and so forth. Yeah, first time in a while. No, just first time ever <laughs> really for a full year that I won't be a full-time student. So that will be nice. It'll be nice to, to get some work experience, especially with the TI. They're, they're great. If you guys don't know them, get on that, check them out. The, the Thomistic Institute is fantastic. They put out a lot of great content, but excited to be working with them. It'd be nice. I'll be on a consistent work schedule, which will be cool. So that means once I move to DC, uh, I'll be able to, and, and Adam and I will be on a more consistent time schedule. So we, we hope to be able to put out some, some more videos more consistently. I have a lot of ideas in the works and I'm excited to, to try to implement them for the channel. And I hope you guys stay through it uh, with us and, and grow with us. Hoping to, to do a lot with the channel. Uh, Adam and I both are. And we just can't thank you enough for your support, for watching the videos, for leaving a like, uh, leaving a comment if you, you have. So thank you for that. We really appreciate it. And we hope to, to provide more stuff for you. And hopefully stuff that's, you know, pretty, pretty good and pretty fun. But for today, we have, uh, I have <laughs> something a little bit different. And it's part of the reason too why I just haven't had time to record. So for those of you that know, um, I think I've mentioned it before, but this is my last semester as a full-time, uh, last semester as a full-time undergrad student not last semester as a full-time student i'll be i'll be a full-time student again probably maybe most likely but my my last semester of undergrad which is just fun graduating with dual degree in philosophy and political science but this year i worked on an undergraduate thesis and it was a lot of fun a lot of anxiety it was challenging, very difficult, but I, I enjoyed it. And yesterday I defended my thesis and it was good. It went much smoother than I initially anticipated. And what I wanted to do was to be able to share my defense with, with you guys. So first breaking it down, what was the, the thesis on? What did I write? So I decided to write about a topic that is totally irrelevant to what's going on in the United States today, and that that was on abortion. Yeah, obviously nothing, nothing going on with all that, right? Uh, no, seriously though, for when the defense happened, especially it's just uh, the defense was yesterday, May what day? May fourth, and just a, a couple days after Justice. Uh, just I almost said Justice Scalia. No, rest in peace. Uh, Justice Alito's draft opinion of how he's rule, uh, how the court's ruling in Dobbs v. Jackson came out. Um, the, his draft opinion from February that came out a few days ago. So it just somehow uh, lined up perfectly in in that front, which was interesting, funny, definitely made some for uh, for some good questions. I cannot speak right now. It's incredible. But when can I ever write? So it, it, it was really, uh, really cool to, to just see how that, that lined up. But more specifically, rather than just abortion generally, it's an undergraduate thesis. If I wanted to write about abortion generally, I'd be writing a full-length book. And who knows? Maybe that'll happen someday. But 
<laughs> that thesis is not the uh, the time nor place for that. And I narrowed it down specifically to looking at bodily rights arguments for abortion, and more specifically than that, looking at Judith Jarvis Thompson's uh, violinist argument. I'm sure many of you have, have heard of that. If you haven't, we're about to go through it and look at it. But Judith Jarvis Thompson has this, this argument for abortion. It's a, known as a bodily rights argument. And they, they presuppose that the, the fetus is a human person with a right to life. But, uh, and for the sake of the argument, not that Thompson actually agrees with that. But they say that just because you have a, a right to life doesn't mean you have the right to use another person's body to continue living. It's very interesting. I definitely recommend that you guys check it out. It's in her essay, uh, Defense of Abortion. So definitely give it a read, check it out. For some of you who are not used to looking at philosophical or ethical arguments for or against abortion, it might be something you read the first time through and you think, wow, this is, this is pretty good. And honestly, you know, the first time I heard it, I thought, wow, this is it's actually pretty solid. But uh, I, what I tried to do in my thesis was address her arguments and try to say that the, the conclusion that she draws on in, in her analogy there doesn't lead to the conclusion that abortion is morally permissible, because that's what she's trying to show, that abortion is morally permissible on these grounds. And so I try to say that conclusion doesn't follow. It's, it's a very um, modest conclusion in that front on the thesis that it's not necessarily saying abortion is wrong and here's why. Uh, so it's not a positive argument, but it's more so a, a negative argument saying that these sets of arguments and this specific argument uh, doesn't work to show that abortion is right. Although one of the objections, which we'll, we'll look at, does uh, acknowledge that. Now, for the defense, I only had about 10, 15 minutes to present and it was it was challenging. Luckily, it was it was nice that I didn't have to sit there and and talk for a while. I imagine most people didn't want to hear me talk for a while anyway. I don't have many interesting things to say <laughs> anyway. So it uh it but it was a challenge to try to get everything in in ten to fifteen minutes. I ended up writing about seventy pages for my thesis. And a little bit more than, than most people, and I don't mean that in, in a braggadocious way, I just mean that that 70 pages was, was a lot, and it was very difficult to get 70 pages worth of content in 10 to 15 minutes, and while trying to do justice to all of the arguments, both the pro-choice and the pro-life arguments. So I focused on some key points in each of the objections that I raised. I ended up raising four objections total to Thompson's argument. And they're not definitely not an exhaustive list. There's so many more objections that can be posed, objections regarding the intentionality of what happens, uh, objections regarding uh, direct killing versus indirect killing and uh, parental obligation. And you know, these might start to make sense as you, uh, as you listen to the, uh, the defense. But what I, I wanted to do was I wanted to share my defense with you guys, share my 10 to 15 minute presentation that I had, and also you know, share the slides and everything so that way you can see what I presented. And I wanted to do this for a few different reasons. One reason was I know that there were some people who wanted to come and see it and they didn't have the opportunity to. So I figured that this might be a cool way to show them. So if you're watching, this one's for you. A second reason is that this is a topic that I'm very passionate about. I really enjoy talking about this. It's very important. And as you can tell with everything going on, as I'm sure if you guys aren't living under a rock, then you know what's going on. Uh, whether you're pro-choice or pro-life, you acknowledge, I'm sure, that this is an important topic. And so I figured this would just be a, a cool way to put another, another voice in the arena. I'm sure that th there are definitely people who are much more equipped and prepared to have an in-depth discussion on this issue. I mean, on the, the pro-life side of things, you know, I'm thinking of 
Trent Horn, uh, Stephanie Gray, Lila Rose, Francis uh, Beckwith, uh, Patrick Lee. Those are uh, some of the people that I've used in my in my most of them pretty much I used in my my thesis Robert George I actually didn't use Robert George in my thesis I read his book Embryo Defense of Human Life which I highly recommend you guys read if you haven't had the chance but it's a phenomenal book but once I figured out okay I'm gonna narrow it down to bodily rights arguments that book didn't help me out as much for that specifically it did address it but very briefly uh, although it's still a fantastic read, I think it's really great, especially to get a better idea of embryology and and what the what happens biologically speaking when human life begins. And so I, I highly recommend that book for uh, for anybody who's just interested in, in getting that take. And and yeah, so I mean, again, those are, are pro life people that are fantastic on the pro-choice side of things. Like I said, Judith Jarvis Thompson, definitely read her defense of abortion. The main person that I address in my thesis as the Thompson advocate is David Boonin. I don't know if any of you have heard of him, but David Boonin is a very prominent pro-choice ethicist, and he uses a lot of bodily rights arguments for abortion. And he's he's incredible in his in his writing he writes very succinctly and persuasively and in his debating too he's debated Peter Kraft on the issue he's debated Trent Horn and he's very persuasive very convincing and so I figured that if there's anybody that I need to really have as my interlocutor and opponent to defend uh, Thompson and that I can really try to to attack it would be David Boone and so if you're looking for some some pro-choice people to read I mean David Boone is one of them and then of course that that's only for the bodily rights side of things there's a bunch of other questions to ask when it comes to personhood that's one of them the value of human life and you can read someone like Peter Singer who has very extreme views on the issue he's definitely the anomaly in the abortion conversation but someone definitely to, to check out and, and take seriously his, his arguments. And there's, there's many more people. I'm drawing a blank on, on quite a few of them right now. R Ronald Dworkin is another. And even not necessarily focusing on just the moral aspect, but even the legal aspect, because that's a whole other can of worms. So there, there's a lot, many facets to this issue. And I definitely recommend for anybody interested, definitely get involved read the arguments. Don't try to straw man any arguments. And that's what I, I tried to do in my thesis. I hope I did a good job of it. But I really tried to present the best pro-choice arguments. Because I think as pro-life people too, we have, we do have a duty to make sure not only that we're defending life, but we're using the, the best arguments that we can to do so. And when people are questioning when human life begins, when is human life valuable? And, and questioning the integrity and the dignity of human life, we, we have a duty to, to respond uh, adequately and also compassionately to not just be jerks about the way we say things. So that's my little spiel about what I am going to present to you guys today. I will be full disclosure. I'll be reading from my, my little defense script that I, I wrote up while I go through the slides, like I said, this isn't a full exhaustive uh, list of objections or replies or analogies that were used There's many analogies, not an exhaustive list at all in this 10 to 15 minute presentation, but the thesis will be publicly available soon. And if not, I'll make sure that I include it in the description of this video for anybody who's interested in reading the full thing, if you would like to, I would be more than honored and happy and especially to receive feedback. That would be amazing, seriously. But of course, there are plenty of other great texts to read out there. I mean, if you would like, I think you can go to the bibliography of my book, uh, of my, my book, not yet. You can go to the bibliography of my thesis and look at a lot of the sources I use there. I, I highly recommend for both the, the pro-life and the pro-choice side. And I, I definitely recommend looking at it. Uh, some of the, the texts in the bibliography don't directly relate to the abortion debate. So some of the, the texts are used to defend other principles in the discussion. So for example, I reference Edward Fazer and St. Thomas Aquinas are 
friendly heroes that we've used multiple times throughout our videos here. Uh, I use a few of their works to talk about and, and Father Garrick Ulu Grange, a Dominican priest from the, the 20th century who uh, to focus on teleology because that comes up a bit as you'll see and uh, to focus on on what that means and, and chants. So we'll bring in Boethius a little bit there. But then there's a, a lot more uh, texts, obviously, that concern directly with the abortion debate. And I definitely recommend for those interested to, uh, to you know, go check those out. And it might just be a little bit more comprehensive and exhaustive. It might be. It will be more comprehensive and exhaustive than the text I'm using. And then you can also read for yourselves to see if I'm giving those authors a, a fair assessment or an accurate representation as well. Or if you think, no, you just totally butchered it. This is not what they were saying. This is what they were saying. Uh, please, uh, either way, criticism, friendly, uh, appraise. I, I would, uh, would appreciate all of it. So without further ado, we will get into the defense. So the title of my thesis is The Limping Violinist, Why Thompson's Defense of Abortion Does Not Demonstrate That Abortion Is Morally Permissible. So here's the overall structure of the thesis and presentation. We'll begin by introducing Thompson's argument and provide some clarifications about it. Then we'll examine four key objections to her violinist argument. For the sake of time, we'll be unable to go over all of the arguments marshaled by both the pro-choice and pro-life ethicists, but I hope to go over what I think are some of the key points and replies in each of the objections. So Thompson begins her essay with her famous violinist thought experiment. She asks you to imagine yourself waking up in a hospital bed, hooked up to a world famous violinist. Last night, a fatal kidney ailment befell the violinist and the Society of Music Lovers determined that your blood alone can help the violinist. Therefore, they kidnapped you and hooked your kidneys up to the violinist's kidneys so that he may continue to live. The good news is that after nine months, the violinist will be fully recovered, at which point you can safely unplug from him. However, if you unplug from him before this point, he will die. Thompson now asks the important question, is it morally required of you to remain plugged into him for the duration of the nine months? It would surely be a nice thing for you to do. In fact, a very generous thing, but are you morally required to remain plugged into him? Thompson answers as would I in the negative. You are not morally required to remain plugged into the violinist. Now, how does this apply to the abortion debate? Well, this kind of argument known as a bodily rights argument attempts to demonstrate that abortion remains morally permissible even if one accepts key premises pro-life people hold, namely that the fetus is a person with the right to life. We agree, for example, that the violinist is a person with a right to life, but his right to life does not entail the right to use your body to continue living. Similarly, even if the fetus is a human person with a right to life, a fetus's right to life does not entail that it has the right to use its mother's body to continue living. Therefore, just as it is morally permissible for you to unplug from the violinist, it is also morally permissible for a mother to unplug from her fetus. While I think Thompson is right that the premise that a fetus is a person with the right to life is insufficient for arguing that abortion is morally impermissible, I believe her argument does not show that abortion is morally permissible. This is because there are four critical and morally relevant disanalogies between her thought experiment and pregnancy, which we will now discuss. One immediate objection commonly posed to Thompson's analogy is that I do not consent to being hooked up to the violinist, whereas a mother consents to engaging in an act which is ordered to the end of procreation. This is commonly referred to as the consent objection. Now, the obvious exception to this is when a mother becomes pregnant as a result of rape, which we will put aside for this objection. We will instead focus on demonstrating that, in light of the consent objection, Thompson's analogy is not successful in establishing the conclusion that abortion is morally permissible in non-rape cases. Some people, like political scientist Eileen McDonough and ethicist David Boonin, argue that Thompson's analogy does apply to cases of pregnancy that result from consensual sex, because consent to sex is different from consent to pregnancy. If this is true, then it would seem that the violinist analogy is properly analogous to pregnancy. Just as you did not consent to being hooked up to the violinist, so too did the mother not consent to being hooked up to her unborn child. She only consented to having sex. We shall call this the sex-pregnancy distinction for convenience. In my assessment, 
there are four major problems with making such a distinction between consent to sex and consent to pregnancy. For the purposes of the defense, we'll discuss two. First, the distinction presupposes that consequences of our action require our consent. However, properly speaking, we can only consent to actions, not consequences. Therefore, it is a misuse of words, as Scott Klusendorf says, to say that someone can consent to pregnancy. Borrowing an example from Rachel Crawford, suppose I go to a roulette table and place my chips on 15, but the ball lands on eight. Once it lands on eight, I say, wait, wait, wait. I consented to bet my money, but I did not consent to lose it. Even if I tried every possible method of cheating so as to not lose my money, and my chances at success were 98%, we would not say that losing my money all of a sudden required some additional consent from me. I can choose how I react to those consequences, but those reactions can then be judged to be right or wrong. Therefore, the sex pregnancy distinction is unintelligible because it misuses the way we use the term consent and applies it to our consequences, not our actions. A second issue with the sex pregnancy distinction is that it can be drawn out and applied to extreme cases since it presupposes that absolutely everything having to do with our bodies requires our consent. Here is a thought experiment Klusendorf uses to demonstrate the point. Quote, suppose that a woman could get pregnant and stay pregnant indefinitely while the fetus inside her did develop into an actual person. Perhaps a physically dwarfed person the size of a baby, but developing the basic kinds of cognition and emotions that children and adults have. Suppose this physically dwarfed, stunted person lives in its mother's belly for decades, fully aware of who it is and where it is. It is trapped in its mother's belly. Suppose it wants to get out and live something like a normal life, but she won't let it. She says, it's my vagina, and I don't have to let you through it. Suppose even that the woman chooses to do all of this on purpose because she likes the idea of having a helpless small person stuck inside her body for its entire life. She lives to a ripe old age of 90, at which time the person inside her has lived a full 70 years of fully aware helpless misery. And then she dies and her 70 year old child dies with her because right up to the end, it's her body and that's how she wants it, end quote. If the implication of the consent to sex versus consent to pregnancy distinction is true, namely that absolutely everything having to do with my body requires my consent, then there seems to be nothing wrong in regards to what the mother does in this twisted thought experiment. This is because on the same grounds as the sex pregnancy distinction, we can make a parallel argument and say that consent to pregnancy is not the same thing as consent to giving birth. And if consent to pregnancy is not equal to consent to giving birth in the same way that consent to sex is not equal to consent to pregnancy, then what the mother did in this absolute autonomy case must be considered morally permissible. It would be nice of her to let her adult child make use of her vagina to leave her uterus and to live his life, but she is not required to do so because this consequence requires her consent. But this seems to be blatantly wrong and this should cause us some deep concern with accepting the sex pregnancy distinction and the presupposition that bodily autonomy is an absolute right. Next, we have the forced dependency objection, which also applies only to cases of pregnancies that result from consensual sex. In the violinist analogy, I did nothing to cause the violinist dependence on my kidneys. However, a mother and father commit an act which is ordered to produce a child who becomes dependent upon her mother's uterus. This seems to be a morally important distinction between the two cases. Boonin attacks the objection by making a distinction between responsibility one and responsibility two. In responsibility one, you are responsible for causing a needy person to exist. Whereas in responsibility two, you are responsible for causing the neediness of a person. By having sex, a couple is responsible in the sense of responsibility one, but not in responsibility two, because they cause a needy person to exist. They do not cause an already existing person to become needy. Thus, Boonin argues that what must be demonstrated is that responsibility in sense one alone is sufficient to generate an obligation to provide the needed assistance. So long as it is not demonstrated that responsibility in sense one generates such an obligation, this objection does not show much force. But Trent Horn asks us to consider the following case. Imagine, quote, imagine a replicator machine that can create any kind of object. If I activate the replicator, there is a high chance that the machine will dispense $10,000. 
there is also a chance that, along with the money, the machine will dispense a healthy newborn infant. If you could find no one else to care for this child, you would become the guardian or parent. Why? Because you engaged in an act that you knew was ordered to creating a helpless human being. And now that human being stands in need of your assistance, abandoning, the, abandoning this infant to die would simply never be tolerated, end quote. In this case, it seems that you are responsible in Boonin's first sense of responsibility, but not in his second sense of responsibility. Yet, it seems like you still have a moral obligation to aid the baby and help him. But if you believe that you do have a duty to, uh, to the baby in this replicator case, then this means responsibility in the sense of responsibility, one, is sufficient for generating an obligation to aid the needy person's neediness, which means a mother has an obligation to aid her fetus. This would mean that the forced dependency objection remains a thorn in the side of Pobbitt's violinist argument that must be surmounted if it is to succeed. This next objection, commonly referred to as the killing versus letting die distinction, is about the difference in the way in which the violinist dies versus the way in which a fetus dies in an abortion. While you are allowed to unplug from the violinist and let him die, you are not allowed to directly cut him up into pieces or induce cardiac arrest in him instead. This is because there's a morally important distinction between killing and letting die. To be more precise, I rely on Philippa Foote's description of killing as the initiation of a fatal sequence of events and letting die as the allowing of a fatal sequence of events to run its course. When you unplug from the violinist, you do not initiate a fatal sequence of events. Instead, you allow an already existing fatal sequence of events, the violinist kidney ailment, to continue running its course. For the sake of argument, Boonin grants this distinction since most pro-life advocates accept such a distinction and bodily rights arguments attempt to defend the moral permissibility of abortion beginning with premises pro-life people generally accept. However, Boonin thinks that although this distinction may apply to many different abortion procedures, it does not apply to all of them. Instead, if the distinction holds, it would just mean that only abortions via hysterotomy in which the fetus is removed from the uterus and permitted to die would be morally acceptable. However, one major problem with this analysis is that while in the uterus, the fetus is in a perfectly safe environment and will continue to live and grow if permitted to stay. The fatal sequence of events which leads to the fetus's death begins only when it is placed into the hostile environment. It would be like if I were on a spacecraft with my two-year-old son and decided to eject him from my spaceship into the hostile environment that is space. This wouldn't be merely allowing a fatal sequence of events to run its course, but initiating the fatal sequence of events that will kill him. Therefore, even abortions via hysterotomy would be an initiation of a fatal sequence of events. And this is distinct from unplugging yourself from the violinist in which there is an already pre-existing fatal sequence of events which causes his death. Put differently, a fetus and my two-year-old son are perfectly healthy individuals that are placed into a harsh environment, whereas the violinist is a sick individual who you allow to succumb to his illness when you unplug from him. As a result, Thompson's analogy is too disanalogous to prove her conclusion. Now, this last objection, the teleological objection, although much more restricted in who it may appeal to, arrives at a stronger claim than the previous three. Stephanie Gray observes that Thompson's analogy falls apart when one realizes that my blood and kidneys exist in my body for my body, whereas a mother's uterus exists in her body for her child's body. I reformulate a similar kind of argument by Jim Stone in the following way. Premise one, a person is entitled to use any organ whose natural function is to keep him alive. Premise two, a fetus is a person, an assumption granted by both Thompson and Boonin for the sake of the bodily rights argument. Premise three, a fetus is entitled to use any organ whose natural function is to keep him alive. Premise four, the uterus of a fetus's mother is an organ whose natural function is to keep him alive. Therefore, the conclusion five, a fetus is entitled to use the uterus of his mother. As you can see, this formulation of the objection is stronger in the sense that not only does it demonstrate a disanalogy between Thompson's violinist and pregnancy, but the conclusion entails that abortion is morally impermissible. The conclusion follows logically from the first four premises, which means that in order to, den in order to deny the conclusion, one must deny one of the premises to escape the conclusion. Premise two is accepted for the sake of Thompson's argument, so we do not need to worry about that. 
Thompson and Boonen can only attack this argument on premise one or premise four. The most controversial premises are premises one and four, since they presuppose an Aristotelian view of nature in which natural bodies like organs have intelligible functions and purposes. Thus, this argument only works if one accepts an Aristotelian-esque conception of teleology. Since I do not have time to go into a larger defense of teleology, I will say that there are a couple of reasons one should embrace this view. First, it's intuitive. When we have a problem with our vision, we go to the eye doctor to get our eyes checked out. Why? Because we believe that our eyes are foreseen. So if there's a problem with our sight, it is because our eyes are having problems. We also believe that our ears are for hearing, our hearts are for pumping blood, etc. We can recognize that a mother's uterus is for her offspring since she can live without her uterus, whereas her offspring cannot live without her uterus. Moreover, if her uterus is for her offspring and we agree that we have a right to the use of the biological equipment that is naturally ordered to our survival, then the fetus has a right to use his mother's uterus. Lastly, one can reject an Aristotelian notion of teleology and argue that my eyes are not foreseen, but on, Dar on Darwinian evolutionary grounds. Instead, the Darwinian can attempt to eschew teleological language by arguing that my eyes are not foreseen, but that I see because I have two eyes. However, rejecting a notion of teleology and function is detrimental to the whole notion of reproductive rights. If there are no such things as organs that are for reproducing, there can be no such thing as reproductive rights, properly speaking. Thus, a full denial of reproductive organs undermines any defense of reproductive rights. In conclusion, Thompson's fascinating violinist thought experiment has an attractive appeal. If one can demonstrate that abortion remains to be morally permissible, given premises which pro-life people hold, then the biggest issue commonly brought up in the abortion debate, is the fetus a person, is irrelevant. Thompson attempts to show that if it is morally permissible for someone to unplug themselves from her world-famous violinist, then a strong right to life does not entail the right to use another person's body to continue living. This, I believe, she succeeds in doing. It seems evident that an individual's right to life is not sufficient for him or her to claim a right to the use of another person's body to continue living. Thus, it would behoove pro-life advocates to strengthen their positive arguments for why abortion is morally impermissible. Since defending the notion that a fetus is a person with the right to life in and of itself does not justify that conclusion. Nevertheless, Thompson and her defenders' mistake is in thinking that the moral permissibility of unplugging herself from the violinist entails that it is morally permissible for a mother to abort her child. This is because there are morally relevant disanalogies between the situation you find yourself in when you wake up connected to the violinist and the situation a mother finds herself in when she has an unwanted pregnancy. Therefore, it is evident that Thompson's violinist analogy is severely limping and is in dire need of improvement if it wishes to establish the conclusion that abortion is morally permissible, lest it be completely abandoned for a better argument to support its conclusion. All right, so that was the defense. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know I messed up a couple times in there, it's fine. But uh, I think it got, got through, the message got through for the most part. Man, I will say, trying to start that screen share and stuff, you're, you're going to see a weird edit at the beginning there. And I think you might see a weird edit in one of the slides. I misspoke, tripped over my words a couple of times. Technology was not functioning with me. So you might see some cuts, but trust me, everything that was said in the defense is there. I also didn't want to include anything that I didn't include the in the defense for the people who wanted to be there but couldn't see it, just so that way you know that there's no alterations or I, so that way you know that this is what was given to the, the, the committee and for the other rest of the audience and that there were no alterations on that front. But I seriously do hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope this gave you something to think about. Maybe you you're pro-choice and you thought, hmm, you know, I've, I've heard of this argument before, but some of these objections sound really interesting and I want to explore them more. That happened and you, you saw that and, and you want to explore those more, then that's amazing. And if you're pro-life too, if you think, man, you know, these pro-choice arguments are, are awful. I hope some of the, the pro-choice arguments I presented made you 
second guess or not second guess, but just like think, oh, okay, this is a pretty good argument. Let me see what happens. But also just convinces you to, to get involved a little bit more into the, uh, the literature of the discussion and of the debate. But if you guys have any questions regarding this, if you'd like to read the thesis itself for whatever reason, feel free to let me know and reach out if you have questions and you think, you know, Nick, you know, this, this argument over here in your defense, I don't think you, you adequately addressed to that. And here's why. Let me know in the comments and I'd be happy to reply. Or if at some point you think, you know, I, I think that this, uh, this was a, a straw man argument. You could have strengthen it better i can say maybe yeah you know this is actually a better argument i just didn't have time to include it in the defense and that did happen don't get me wrong there were some some i think better pro-choice bodily rights arguments or analogies that were included for instance responsibility one and responsibility two i was operating off of david boonin's definitions for those uh, responsibilities in his book, A Defense of Abortion, but he does provide a different definition for responsibility one and responsibility two in his book, Beyond Row, why abortion should be legal even if the fetus is a person. I'm looking to the right because I actually have the book right on my desk. I can actually free advertisement for David Boone and pro-choice ethicists. You see, I'm fair to, to all parties. Beyond Row, which we actually might get Beyond Row at this point, so that's that's funny, but ironic, I should say. So beyond Roe, why abortion should be legal, even if the fetus is a person that came out in 2019, so it's fairly recent, um, but he does change his, his definition slightly in that book, but I still respond to it. And I respond to it in the same way using Trenthorn's replicator case. I think that's a fantastic case. And that's in his book, Persuasive Pro-Life. And you know what, just so that way we're, we're fair, we do one pro-choice advocate, one pro-life advocate, and then no one can, can judge me for being partisan in this issue because of course I don't have a side on the matter but uh this is Trent Horn's book Persuasive Pro-Life how to talk about our culture our culture's toughest issue you don't need to see my face there it is although he did announce in his recent video that he's coming out with a second edition second edition of Persuasive Pro-Life very soon which part of me is very excited for another part of me is very frustrated that I didn't get a hold of this edition or didn't see his arguments in this edition. He probably responded to some arguments in David Boonin's uh, newest book, which could have helped me out. So Trent, if for some reason you're watching this, I don't see why you would be, but if you are, I'm upset that you should have given me a second edition and said, oh, I know you're writing your thesis. Unbelievable. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm kid, I kid. But seriously, with that said, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you have any questions or comments or you want to see more about this, if you want me to explore this issue more, again, this is an issue I'm very passionate about. I really do care a lot about pro-life apologetics. I think that this is a serious issue. Again, it's it's a philosophical thing that we, we can use philosophy and logic to talk our way through this, but it's an issue that also has a lot of practical concern and consideration. I do actually applaud David Boonin in his preface or introduction to a defense of abortion. He talks about how philosophers shouldn't just philosophize about this, like it's some sort of abstract concept that has a lot of real world implications. And it's not just some linguistic or logical game that we can play. And so I thought that was, was pretty great of him to, to acknowledge and to say. So, and I think that that is very, very true. So, which, which is also why I'm very passionate about this. So if you guys like to see me talk about this issue more, if you'd like to see me talk about uh, certain pro-choice arguments, pro-life arguments, if there's like, Nick, I've run into this argument uh, talking to someone who's pro-choice and I need help trying to figure this out, or you're pro-choice and you say, you know what, I don't get why pro-lifers say this thing, or what's the deal with, with this here. I'd be more than happy to, to make a video possibly if it's, if it's enough that I think that, you know, video is worth addressing it. I'd be more than happy to, to make a video on that. Or if not, I'll just reply to the comment if I think that it's, I can just do it in a couple of sentences and that's all it takes. But that said, thank you guys. Really appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you got something out of it and stay tuned for more till the next time. God bless.